never real happy with my earlier stuff. You know, I was still searching for who was Gary Wilson. I don't like to talk about drugs too much, but one time I experimented with LSD when I first came out to San Diego. I said, well, I'll try this stuff and see what happens. And, you know, I thought the first time I tried it, I thought, boy, the piano sounds beautiful, you know, I'm <laughs> playing the piano. And, you know, I had laid off it for two days after trying it for a week. I was trying it for a week every day, and then it built up a resistance and it wasn't working that well. And then we were talking LSD. Huh? And all of a sudden it peaked at the end of the show. Tom was playing guitar with the band. And the guitar sounded like a bee. The sad reality of the music world is that thousands of talented and amazing artists get lost and forgotten in the landfill that we call the music industry. With rigged algorithms, industry plants, and payola ruling the industry with an iron fist it's no wonder many are left in the dust. And this is nothing new. Today's underground heroes like Nell Word and George Clanton were yesterday's cleaners from Venus and the replacements, artists with the potential to become just as big and influential as the likes of David Bowie or even Trent Reznor. But what about the artists who don't even make it to that underground hero status? Well, sadly they tend to be forgotten in time with no real hope of ever having their work discovered or appreciated. But every once in a while, when the planets align, we see an unlikely resurrection. And I can't think of one just as notable or deserving as the terrifying musical genius hailed as an inspiration to artists such as Beck and Earl Sweatshirt, the one and only Gary Wilson. In the night, I feel right There's something about the way the darkness makes me feel When I can still feel alone, but I'm not afraid Of the night, I feel right The darkness makes me think about you To say that Gary is a one-of-a-kind artist is to say the least, and his origins are no different. Born and raised in the Endicott area of New York State, with a programmer by day and bassist by night father, Gary naturally followed his footsteps and taught himself a number of instruments, including the bass, guitar, piano, drums, synthesizers, and even the cello, becoming something of a musical prodigy at the age of 12, even teaching himself home recording skills with eight track recorders and early cassette tapes. All this during a time when home recording was nearly unheard of, Though, it was at the age of 16 that Gary would be given some advice that would plant the seeds of his musical identity to come. Gary had caught the attention of the famous composer John Cage, someone who would continue to be an inspiration and obsession for him into his adult life. Cage invited the teenager to his home to critique and discuss his early recordings after taking an interest in the letters and recordings that Gary had sent to him. Over the course of a few different meetings, Cage would give Gary a lot of advice, but there was one bit of it that stuck with him more than anything else did, and that was the quote, If your art doesn't irritate people, then you aren't doing your job. Taking this advice to heart, Gary became increasingly experimental and avant-garde with his songwriting and lyricism, taking an almost shock rock approach to his look and sound. But rather than imploring in the typical punk or hard rock sound of the early 70s, Gary took this approach to jazz and new wave music, sounding wholly unique from anyone else at the time. And with that, it was off to the races. Gary focused all of his energy on two things, writing a fantastic debut record to try and get signed, and building a local following through some pretty intense and strange live shows. To speak on these live shows, well, not many photos and absolutely no video has been archived of them. But from what's been described, Gary and his live band would absolutely terrorize audience with their strange interludes, vulgarities, cross-dressing, and some pretty interesting uses of duct tape, cellophane, milk, and fake blood. Given the odd and almost night predator type lyrics, it's no surprise that audiences and promoters would come to hate Gary with some venues even going as far as shutting off the power in attempts to get him to leave. But a live show is one thing, 
So, how about Gary's music? Did it live up to the hype of the shows in the Persona? Yes, it absolutely did. In 1977, Gary Wilson released his magnum opus, and for nearly 30 years, his only full-length record, You Think You Really Know Me. The album was completely self-recorded, with nearly all the instruments being played by Gary himself. The album was an odd and experimental take on jazz and new wave, focusing on groovy bass lines and fluttering synthesizers with jazz pianos to just bring everything to 11. To this day, there really isn't anything like it, and that's not even mentioning the odd and often uncomfortable nature of the lyrics on this record. Oh, you say you were? 16. With Gary singing twisted love songs that might not have been direct references to anything wrong, but simply due to the awkward and just strange way that Gary sings them, they take on an extremely odd tone. The record's tone and vibe are perfectly captured by its cover of a well-dressed Gary Wilson standing next to a rundown and disgusting basement wall, giving the cover an odd and otherworldly kind of vibe to it. But what is the music actually like? Well, You Think You Really Know Me starts off with a dark and atmospheric intro track titled Another Time I Could Have Loved You. Starting off the album with a busy and dark ambience with keyboards and guitars blaring while we hear busy city streets in the background creating a very sleazy club vibe to the sound. Though we're instantly given whiplash with the album's second track and first official song, You Keep On Looking, where Wilson shows off his immense talent of writing catchy and poppy songs that carry very discomforting undertones beneath them. The track is so good, I even did a cover of it myself. And for the most part, this is the best track to get you into Wilson's music. But in true Gary Wilson fashion, the groove is just the bait because the next track is the infamous 6.4 equals makeout, a song made up of slow and pretty jazz chords contrasting with Gary's creeping and unsettling croons about a teenage girl that he's fawning over. 6.4 The song is both beautiful and haunting, but not in the usual, this song is pretty but has a sad and meaningful lyrics behind it kind of way. Rather, it sounds like the ramblings of an obsessive stalker, a theme the name of his live band, The Blind Dates, really encapsulated. And this theme continues on another standout track from the album, Cindy. Cindy is one of Gary's finest songs musically and shows some similarities with a certain indie rock legend who would come to prominence decades later. The song itself is a fun jazzy rock song with childish lyrics about a girl. And as you can hear, it's pretty gloriously written. It was even later re-recorded in 1980 as a track that Gary would shop around to labels in an attempt to get signed. Two other notable tracks off this record would be Gary's most popular song, I Wanna Lose Control, and Chromium Bitch. I Wanna Lose Control is usually the go-to track people reference when talking about You Think You Really Know Me. It carries all the staples that the album would be well known for, including the lo-fi recording, groovy bass lines, jazz chords, and Gary's one-of-a-kind voice. And 
while in my opinion it's been a bit overplayed, it's still a fantastic song and well worth your time. Now, Chromium Bitch, on the other hand, is a fucking masterpiece, and probably the most mature track on the record. If any song would have been a radio hit for Gary, it would be this one. The entire song shows off Gary's jazz credentials and sounds like the perfect mean-spirited jam, with contrastingly aggressive lyrics over a lush and beautiful chord structure and drums being played under them, a fitting crescendo before the album's closing song. Think You Really Know Me would go on to be a hidden gem for the few who heard it becoming lifelong fans. But the sad reality is that at the time, it never really took off, and being an independent artist in the 70s wasn't exactly an option like it is now. So a year after its release, Gary and his small ragtag of live musicians would move out to the West Coast, making San Diego their home in hopes of attracting talent scouts and landing a record deal. But much like what happened in New York, Gary would only find local success in the underground, even catching the attention and admiration of fellow avant-garde musicians The Residents, but he would ultimately retire from music in 1981 after extensive touring and less than successful attempts to get signed. And with that, the unsung legend would disappear. Gary Wilson fell into obscurity shortly after his retirement, and like most other small undiscovered artists, he faded away. But this reversed in the summer of 1997 when the at the time newcomer and radio star, Beck, began citing Gary as an influence in press events and at concerts, even going as far as name dropping him in the song Where It's At. Drivers, shine your shoes, your microphone blues, hit his shoes with your parachute boots. That's your provision from coast to coast. Check my man, Gail Wilson, rock the most. With the lyrics, passing the duchy from coast to coast, let the man Gary Wilson rock the most. And thanks to this, a new wave of interest came looking for Gary and his infamous record, You Think You Really Know Me which was long out of print at the time, and in a similar move by Sub Pop Records, its founders had stated that they were inspired by Wilson as well. This all came to a head when the record label Motel Records began heading an extensive search, including hiring a private detective to find Gary Wilson. And while for the first few years the search was unsuccessful, it was by contacting previous band members that they were able to locate Gary in 2000. A nearly 50-year-old man at this point, he was extremely honored by the attention and even gave Motel Records permission to repress You Think You Really Know Me and a handful of singles and rarities. Even returning to the stage for the first time since the early 80s in 2002 just to promote the release. Not long after that, Gary was signed to the legendary alternative hip-hop label Stone's Throw of MF Doom and Mad Lib fame. And in 2004, the first full-length project by Gary was released. Sleep 
It's getting dark. I think I'll take a walk on through the Northside Park. Mary Had Brown Hair is the name of the long-awaited second record by Gary Wilson. Made up of both new and long unreleased material, written over the nearly 30 years between it and his first record. So the question is, was the album worth the wait? And well, that depends. If you wanted a more straightforward record, then you'll be sorely disappointed because Mary Had Brown Hair is even more experimental and avant-garde than its older brother. The album takes the old sound and pushes it into a much more raw and dirty direction with a heavier focus on guitars and pitch-shifted vocals this time around, as well as Gary's more self-indulgent side of songwriting, with a lot more of the creepy and droning breaks and songs, similar to what we heard on 6.4 equals Make Out. And all that being said, let's have a look at the record and some of its standout tracks. The album kicks off with the intro track, A Very Small Town. A pretty intro that sets the tone and gives it a very cheery vibe even though there's some darker chords doing their thing in the background. But don't get it twisted, this is still Mr. Wilson so this is just a way of lulling you into a false sense of security before it shifts into something entirely different. And entirely different is exactly what it does on the first real track off the album, Linda Wants to Be Alone. Every night I try to teach Linda, she's so out of reach, the girls are swimming at the beach. This track is one of the most conventional rock style songs you can find on the album, and that's saying a lot when it's already covered in goofy vocals, obsessive stalker-like lyrics, and a much more crunchy lo-fi sound. The record takes a minute with another interlude, something the entire record kind of indulges in between most songs. The next full-length song, though, is Debbie Debbie, a track that sounds like it would be right at home on You Think You Really Know Me. Debbie, Debbie, tell me what to do. My heart feels lonely when I think of you. Debbie, I wanna talk to you. The song itself sounds like a sad mushroom trip, jumping back and forth from upbeat to downbeat. The lyrics continue the odd fantasies and experiences Gary is having with the different girls he sings about all over the record. Now, let me just say that if I fully dissect this album the way I normally would in my other videos, we would be here all day and honestly it deserves a full listen, so let me just tell you about its standout tracks. At least the ones I consistently return to, because spoiler alert, this album's not for everyone and uh, it's kind of not for me either. There's songs that I like on it, but it really is a mixed bag. It's something that more of an avant-garde jazz fan would be really into. That being said, Gary's in the Park is what I think should have been the lead single off this record. It's groovy and fun and very poppy, and it's just goofy and off enough to keep up with the album's odd and experimental sound. My friends are waiting for me in the light, the lights in you. The song has a fun vibe to it, with a mostly lighthearted tone complemented especially by the twangy 70 guitar riffs being played in the background. Now, the track Gary saw Linda last night is the exact opposite. Gary saw Linda last night, kissing Frank Roma, he was sad. Thought they were lovers, but then I was glad. This song is dark and haunting. And by haunting, I mean it's really fucking uncomfortable. Because it just lulls you in with these really 70s style guitar riffs that are really fun. And then it just goes into this droning with the schizo nightmare vocals of Gary going on a tangent about the girl that he's been fawning over the entire record kissing his friend as he watched from the woods. The whole thing is just creepy and dirty and it, it feels wrong. It's effective in driving the discomfort Wilson obviously aimed for here. Just listen to this shit. You should have never thought that I wouldn't find out, but I watched you. I watched you through the trees as I hid up in the woods. And I saw you kissing Linda. You were kissing Linda. You were kissing Linda, and I didn't even think one moment that you would even, that you would even think about me. You didn't think what I would think, but I guess that... 
But if anything could be said about Mary Had Brown Hair as a whole, it's that this project really delivers on the hints of night stalkerishness and some of the uncomfortable moments on You Think You Really Know Me. They're doubled down here, but not in a way that takes away from the music, but really kind of amps it up into something entirely unique and different from even anything we heard from Gary before this. The last track I really want to talk about from this record is Hold Back the Daylight, the album's last full song before it plays off with another outro track. The song brings a great blend of the classic and new sounds that have been juggled across this entire record. And unlike most of what's been heard, it kind of ditches the more 70s approach in favor of an 80s one. And with that, the album ends. Overall, Mary Had Brown Hair is an odd and interesting record, and while it might not be as timeless or fun as You Think You Really Know Me, it's definitely a fitting second outing and a worthy listen, even if it's a bit more clunky and strange than its older brother. From here, Gary and crew would begin hitting the road and touring more often and releasing material on a regular basis taking advantage of the cult following that had gained over the course of the last 30 years. Gary Wilson has gone on to release 14 full-length records and become one of the most beloved figures in the underground music scene, inspiring hundreds of artists across the world. His music is a testament to just how far creativity and ambition can take you, and what one guy with a tape machine in his parents' basement can create, and the lasting impact that they can have on the world around them. Gary is a genius, and I hope this video has got you interested in looking into his rich discography. But with all that being said, subscribe, support me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter, I'll see you in the next video. It's me, Madison Ray. Played up your pathetic little babe pitties.